Jesse, uh, you know, I honestly say that he's a pillar in the program. Did you, Alex, did you take, you took the investments class with me? With you, yes. Yeah, that was all his material. And as I took that over, he, Jesse got really swamped. They've transitioned to business. He works for a company called the Silver Companies. And I, I, I don't want to state it wrong. Um, so old man Silver was like an old, um, I think it was like a used car salesman in Northern Virginia. And he sort of parlayed that into, okay guys, phone's off, computer's off, eyes up here, whatever you're reading, put it away. In fact, one of the things I just complained about to Jesse who's on the board is this classroom, because I need eyes, okay? I need eyes, I don't need computer screens. Um, so their company, so the guy parlayed this all into a whole real estate fortune, primarily doing large track multi-plan communities in Northern Virginia. And how they wound up in Boca is the old man moved down here. But all the real estate operations had continued to be in Virginia. But as part of the crisis in 2007, 2008, they had to go through a whole big corporate transition. And they kind of, you know, you know, gone into their now more of a family office more than anything else that kind of runs as a private equity fund. They do a tremendous amount of debt. A lot of the deals he was bringing today they don't participate in as partners, they participated primarily as lenders. So they'll bring debt with equity to deals. Um, but you know, they just got really busy, and as you heard him say, I mean, he's on the corporate plane, you know. He's so, he had to stop. And, uh, you know, at one point he's like, look, I can't teach this class, but he gave me all the material, and I took it. It was, you know, it was very helpful to do that. But he's a great guy. Uh, he was a great instructor. I sat in on some of his classes, and. He has had and continues to have the best interest of the program at heart. So, I mean, you, you've been working with him. I don't know if you. Yeah, he's been um, he's been great. Always reaching out. He's your mentor here. Yeah. Oh, Hands up. I didn't know. I didn't. Yeah, no, I saw you crowding in on Michael's. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't think he had a mentor. I don't know. What? Is that like a value oh. judgment? Is that <laughs> how, did, how did you derive that? <laughs> How are you going on record with that? Okay. Did you press the Listen, what, what I'm prepared to do, if, if you're interested, and if you're not interested, that's okay. I, I got, and it may be too late, I don't know what's going on, I got several of you that asked me questions over the last week about <coughs> this um, project in West State, the airport West that you guys are, are working on. Is there anything, because I've gotten it from different people, and I just had a difficult week where I couldn't spend a lot of time is there anything that I can help you with? I can spend 30 minutes for the benefit of the class if you want me to, answering questions or sharing some insight on that market. I don't know, where are you guys with that project right now? What? what? We're directing our focus towards the market because we're trying to put together a marketing what, what, Forget, what are you off, what, do you, what have you been asked to do? Let's be more basic than that. What is your project? You're in a class, right? Just, what, what are you going to get a grade for? They want to differ, differentiate their product from the rest of the product that's out there. We're making a presentation to DCT about what their site can do and how they can differentiate. Okay, so DCT is a developer. Right. right. Okay. It's a re. Mm -hmm. It's a re. That focuses on industrial product. Right. Okay. I'll get back to that in a second. And they offered their project in Airport West to this program for you to deliver advice to them, right? They right. said, hey, you can use this as a case study because they want something from you, right? Right. Okay, and what you're getting out of it is some real life experiences, right? And you're getting a grade? Well, yes, you're grading it. And you're actually, getting a grade and there's also like a scholarship potentially yeah. involved? Yes. And you've been broken down into four groups? Three, Three groups. Three groups. Three groups of five, and so you guys are competing yeah. for everybody's time and money. You're competing for everybody, right? Okay, so you're competing to put together ultimately a presentation? Yes. yes. Written? Written well, and, um, and oral. Right. And you're going to make this to the head of this, whoever's in charge of this project down here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and so you had conversations with them this week? Yeah. Yes. Individually? Yes. Yes. Or separately, I should say. Three Separate different groups. groups. You got on the phone with whom? With um, 
Todd and I forget the other guy's name. Todd and Ted. Todd and Ted. Okay, Todd and Ted are who within this Todd organization? Is ECP, Ted is uh, no, Ted the is, organization. Ted, Ted is the guy from SIOR. Yeah. Okay, but That's does he have is. any involvement in the project? He's the one, I guess, sponsoring the project is how he, he uh, prefaced. Mm -hmm. But he's say sponsoring the project. What do you mean by that? I mean that it's, he's, if, if there's a dollar amount involved with the rewarding, then maybe he's the one that is, is presenting that. What's the guy's name? Ta Ted what? Ligety or something like that? Um, oh, here. You guys were on a call with him yesterday. You should know that name off the top of your tongue. He's with no, SIOR. He's, he's, he's the SIOR guy. Yeah, I, I mean, he's, I, he the is sponsoring. He is sponsoring this competition. He has nothing to do with that project. Co yeah, correct. The competition. I, I, uh, I, I, that's, that's what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to say the dollar value of the, the spot, I don't even know what the award is. But do you know what SIOR is? is? No. The Society of Industrial and Office Realtors. There you go. Okay, so if you are, you should know this stuff. I, I just You're on a call with somebody, you got to investigate this stuff. I didn't know stuff. he was going to be on the call. Okay. SIOR is relative within the realm of real estate brokers is a relatively prestigious organization, and it's comprised generally of brokers that deal exclusively in office and industrial product. And you really need to have a competency in both. So if you're just an office broker, you can't get into SIOR. And they really do, you know, they all put their initials at the end and all that. It generally is a higher grade of commercial broker. I mean, that's been my experience. Guys that belong to SIOR tend to be a little bit more professional. They, it, it's just a, it's, it's a professional guild, um, um, but these guys, you know, tend to be better. They sponsor a scholarship, right, once a year, or they wanted to do this for some time. I talked to a guy three years ago that was the head of SIOR. I had Michael follow up. Nothing ever came of it. And I guess, you know, it's now happening. Okay. What is the responsibility of the guy at DCT? What, what is his role in the organization? Who were you talking to? What's his role? What's his objective? I think he was, um, is he a project manager? Is he a VP of development? Is he a financial guy? I think he's on the development side. Okay, but a REIT, he's, by definition, can't really develop a lot, so. He's their regional vice president. For he's South a regional Florida. vice president. So he oversees the leasing, acquisition, and development for South Florida office. Okay, how, how many, what's, what's the magnitude of DCT? How big are they? How many square feet do they own? You got their, their supplemental report, their reporter here. It lists. How much of that product is in South Florida? What's the profile of that product? And by the way, I'm, that, I, I wouldn't have gone on a call with somebody without understanding all this stuff because number one is I need to know who I'm talking to and what, what he's going to ask me. 74 million square feet in 20 throughout the country. Markets throughout What's the, the market cap of this entity? 13,500 common shares at whatever their price is. <laughs> Is it a big REIT? Is it a little REIT? What type product, the 74 million square feet, what type product is it? Because they are definitely not Prologis, okay? They are definitely not East Group, okay? And they are definitely not First Industrial. So, who are they? I don't know anything about them. That's why I'm asking you. And the reason I'm asking you that is because I saw the profile of what they want to build here. But it's not what they do in other places. They, uh, they have a um, they have 401 consolidated operating op operating properties. Six. Okay, stop one second. 74 million square feet, 400 properties. That sounds like they own a whole bunch of small properties. Yes, a lot of these here on what they've on the recent sales have all been somewhere in the 175, 228. I don't know what that means. 175 what? Almost square footage. So so they've been buying assets that are 175,000 square feet. But do the math, 174 million square feet, 400 properties, that sounds to me like less than 200,000 square foot feet in asset. Now they're doing almost a 400,000 square foot project, right? What's the profile of these 400 assets? What type of industrial product is it? 
Is this front loaded? Is this rear loaded? Is it distribution space? Is it manufacturing space? What's the office build back component? Because ultimately that's all going to talk back to how does their understanding of what they deliver contrast with what the market they're trying to develop in is. I don't know if they have anything else in South Florida, do they? Do they have anything else in South Florida? They have a building not too far from. Yeah, they do. OK, what, what building do they own? They have this whole list in South Florida. Um, one, two, one, 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 all within 10 miles of the site. No, 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 no. I mean, 10 miles. 10 miles. I mean, West, Miami West. <laughs> no, no. Give me addresses. Give me buildings. 1600 Northwest 70th Avenue in Miami. Okay, that's like yeah. Class C industrial property. How big is that building? I didn't expand on the length. Okay. To the uh, to your question about what makes it up, uh, they're into light industrial properties, high volume distribution market in the U.S. And actually okay, the they're, they're looking to build 200,000 square foot big box industrial product and they're talking about what Prologis is and I forget the name, what the, whatever the trade port people are mm -hmm. and, and the beacon center type boxes are, but that's not their market is it? No. Doesn't sound like no. it. So they're trying to build something that's not like what they are. Correct. Like it looks like it, right? So, yeah. so logically, that would lead you to the first question, which you found out yesterday, which is, we need help marketing this thing because we don't know anything about this. Because ultimately, Prologis, one of the advantages that Prologis has in their markets, they come in and they, they own the market. They own Beacon Lakes. They own Beacon Center. They own a bunch of stuff up in Medley. And why is that important? Because now they can work with tenants. As tenants expand, contract, need more space, they can work with them in a market. Because we go back to real estate as a local market. Uh -huh. So why do I ask the question, where are their properties? Because some of the questions I asked you guys are, who's marketing this asset for them? Who's the broker that they're using? Who's the listing broker? They don't have one yet. All questions are being filtered through this guy, uh, Todd. They haven't closed on the property. So they haven't bought this yet? No. Okay. Do they have it under contract? Yeah. Yes. yes. They have it under contract. But they haven't hired a marketing team yet. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> no, what marketing, team is, marketing team is brokers. I'm not talking about like real marketing. I'm talking about real estate marketing. Brokers. He, I asked that question yesterday. He said they've talked to a lot of brokers but haven't. Who are their brokers in the assets that they own today? Or do they... Do they Lease in house. I mean, that smaller type landlords tend to do in house leasing. Because when you when you look at all their ten properties I had mentioned, they all have that same Orlando number, which links back to Todd. Give me the address. What? Give me the address. Okay. Um, you know, sixteen hundred Northwest Seventieth Avenue, twentieth and seventieth. Those are all inside. 826, that's all old bay or old, you know, small bay, front loaded junk. Miami Commerce Center, junk, front loaded, okay. Uh, some of the stuff's not even, no, but why am I, listen, I love junk. The fund I'm in, that's what we buy. Mm -hmm. But but the guy who, who buy who rents that junk, needs 1,500 square feet, all his operations are on it, he doesn't even need a dock. Because he, you know, he, he, they hand load stuff in the trucks. Because his clients are also small clients and they don't have docks. But it goes back to knowing your customer. Mm -hmm. So if you're renting to 1,500 square foot guys, and now you want a 200,000 square foot guy, it's a whole totally different ball game, right? right. 1400 Northwest, 159th Street. That's right up here. That's at the Cloverleaf. That's, I don't know much about that site, but that's, that's called like the Miami International Commerce Center or whatever. Um, Gateway Industrial Park is what it's called. That thing's from like the 1950s. So I don't, you know, I haven't been in there in a long time, but it's, 
it's a radically different product. So these guys now are going to buy raw land, do greenfield development, which doesn't sound like they've done before, right? And so, and it's big box, it's radically different than they want, right? So, my question to you is, is do, do they have any idea what they want to do with this? They're debating it. They, I mean, they, they initial look at it is a, as a distribution center, but they're open to, you know. What's it zoned for? It is right now they're looking to change the zoning. What is it zoned for? It's zoned, it's like a transitional zone area, and they. Interim. Interim zone. G -G. And which which can accommodate yeah. different uses, but you have to like solidify the zone um, before development, and then. Um, what is the zoning on it? When you look at the Beacon Council's me, website, it's being it's showing as agricultural on the Beacon Council's website. That's what what is the zoning on? Did you pull up a prop, a parcel? Right. Did you go? You went to the website uh -huh. to the Miami Dade County. Yeah. Yes. Pro, and what's what's the zoning G -U. on it? G U general use. General use. Okay, is it in, within the, the in, uh, um, urban development boundary or no? Yes. So it is general use within the industrial development, uh, the urban development, urban development boundary. Urban development boundary. With hopes of getting to the UVA. It has, it has no zoning. General use basically allows, you know what you can put in there? You can put agricultural, agricultural uses and you can put a bunch of like bizarre industrial uses. Right next to here, there's an old fat rendering facility. See, odd off stuff, animal slaughterhouse. I mean, I don't know, what, if you go to general use yeah, in yeah, Dade yeah. County, there's a whole bunch of bizarre industrial uses that you could put in these places, but you can't build industrial here right now. Right, so they, they're looking to change it. Okay, so is your contract contingent on that or no? They, they think that they are, they're pretty much solid on getting that zoning changed, so I'm not sure about whether they have that contingency in there. Okay, who's the seller? Who's the owner? Who's the current owner now? Philip Brawler. Browner. Okay. Is he like a trustee for something? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, private owner. Yeah. Does this front 836? Um, no. Not really. It does not. There's another street there for us. 13th. Correct. 13th or 11th? 13th. 13th. Down the bottom is 13th in between and 36th. No. Yeah, but it, it fronts. I mean, it, that, that's, I mean, I don't know what, you know, the distance is there. But the reason I ask that is that they're changing zoning on that with the population density there. And I understand these guys are an industrial REIT, but is industrial the highest and best use there? Can you do retail there? Why do I ask that? Because we were going to take something like 40 acres of Beacon Lakes just east of this and try to get retail use for it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the demand was there. And why do I ask this? Is industrial a higher use than retail or a lower use? Lower, lower, use. lower use. Retail is a lower use than industrial? No, 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 higher, higher. higher. Right. So, now, again, this may not be the question he wants to hear, but I, th I think that's a question that you internally at least need to, to debate, okay? Because if you've got to go through a zoning process, make sure you at least get the highest use out of it. Right. They might make more money if they got it locked up and go through the process and then flip it to Regency or, you know, some other retail mm -hmm. developer or re. Okay. When you factor in your surrounding uses? when you try to make that decision? Well, you, you have to. I mean, you have to take a look at the entire market, right? And the demographic, I mean, you, I, I'm not, I'm doing the market analysis class and I'm not good at that. But, you know, draw your flag. What do you got around there? How many households? What's the income, right? What competing properties do you have? Because ultimately we come back to, here are the critical questions. So let's go, let's jump beyond that and say, okay, so because it's a REIT, right? Some of the questions that were sent to me if you knew this was a REIT, you know, what's the holding period? Guys, if it's a REIT, it's going to be a long-term hold, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the real question becomes right now is, is how big, we went through this the other day, how big is the industrial market in Dade County? Come on, you should know this. 200, 200 million square feet. Yeah. How much of that is concentrated in Airport West and Medley? Call it half, just for argument's sake. 100 million square feet. What's the vacancy? 
16 percent or something. Like 16 percent. Try again. Like eight or six or something like that, right? What's the absorption? Why am I, I'm leading to something with this? What's the absorption? How many square feet are being absorbed a year for the last three years in this area? Didn't I send you the CoStar report? I have it right here. Yeah, but you should know this stuff now. You got on a phone call with somebody. I'm going to ream you now. Because you're representing me. You're not just representing yourselves, you're representing this program. So you're going to get a call with a professional. As instructors, we've represented you guys as professionals. And you're here to add value. I'll give you a bigger adult. You weren't on the call with me, or I would have gone over this with you if you would have gotten on the call. I had a meeting. I explained all of that. I got drawn in. I couldn't skip out. But this is where we wind up. Sorry, I had to vent. I had to vent because, you know what? I had meetings, too, and I made the time for it. And then, as, a, as an instructor, what's disappointing is to get a bunch of calls or emails the day of or the day before you're meeting with somebody asking a bunch of questions that we should have asked a week ago. So we would have gone into the meeting prepared. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And maybe Fred doesn't do this. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm not happy. I'm not happy because you guys are our face. Okay, what's the absorption? 612,680 square feet. One, for what period? The third quarter of 2014. So there was a positive third quarter of 2014? Yes. The third quarter of 2014? That report only goes to the second quarter, I think. Now this is Q3. Yeah, I have a million six in... For, for how long? We're year to date on 2014. Okay, and so what was it the year before? Third quarter. And what was it the year before? 3.1. Okay, so we had 3 million square feet of positive absorption. Now, is this all of Dade County or is this a submarket? This is Dade County, the one I was quoting with you. Let's go to the submarket. That's what we're going to compete for. So, Airport, Doral? Airport West and Doral. Airport West. And if you want to use Medley as a proxy, because there is some, some substitution. I'm not a marketing expert, but you can, you know, there's certain things like margar margarine can be a substitute for butter, right? But is beer a substitute for wine? I mean, only if you want to get drunk, but if you really want to have a proper drink, it's not really a substitute, right? So some tenants, some tenants might be able to go to Medley or to Airport West, but some some can't. Some tenants have to be in Airport West. Why? Location. Uh, why? The proximity to what? To the airport. And 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 con well, forget the seaport because Medley is closer to the seaport geographically than Beacon Lakes. But you got to go down Okeechobee. You never get there as opposed to going straight down 836. Plus, there's another issue. What do all the people that live in that market live off of? What do the tenants live off of? What is Miami, what is, what is the industrial base of Miami? It's a distribution environment. What do companies do here? You gone to the port? Have you looked at have you looked at the reports of what comes in and out of the port of Miami? Foreign goods. <laughs> Give the man a star. Okay. And let's go a little bit further than that. Yes, Ford. What? Who do we export to? Who do we export to? Who do we import from? And who do we export to? Have you gone to World City News? What drives the economy? Because that's what these people want to know. Who's going to be my tenant? Right. So what drives the economy in Dade County? Airport. Tourism. And? Tourism. Okay, there's a, there's a component of tourism. There's a, a component of wealth management. But as it relates to a, an industrial real estate developer, what drives the economy in Dade County? What drives the 200 million square feet of competing product that you have? 
distribution. Miami is a point of consolidation of goods. Merchandise comes into Miami in container loads and leaves in less than container loads. So what's the typical flow of goods into Miami? Guys, you should look at this stuff as part of this because that's how you understand who ultimately might be a tenant for here. Who are the bigger importers? Or what countries do we import the most from? Would it surprise you to hear it's China? Okay. What other places might we import from? France. That's not surprising. What could be coming from France? I don't know. We'll take a look at it, right? Uh, so the general flow of goods tends to be industrial goods and luxury items coming in to be broken down and redistributed where? Foreign trade zone. Not a foreign trade oh, no, zone. No, 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 if, 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 let's use a, if a, if a, if a Chinese manufacturer of brake pads or clutches is going to ship 20 containers of clutches to the United States, to the U.S. market, where is that ship going to stop? Where is that ship going to stop? Port, port ever, yeah. What port? Miami. No! In Long Beach. Why is it going to come all the way to here? Or in Seattle? Maybe San Francisco. Probably not. Which is the most, which is the busiest seaport in this country? Long Beach, by far. So, if goods are coming here for U.S. consumption, do you think they're going to come to Miami? I don't draw well. You guys know that, right? So, we got this big country. Here's Florida, right? I, I know I'm not drawing this to scale, okay? And there's 3,000 miles like this. And there's 1,600 miles like this, right? Right? So if I'm going to distribute brake pads or clutch, and I'm coming from here, do you think I'm going to go all the way to here? No. no. To then distribute here? If I'm going to distribute stuff to the southeast of this country, where am I going to go? If I want goods that are going to be distributed to the southeast, which is a regional distribution facility? Which is Jackson. Hold on a second. What is a regional distribution point of goods for merchandising in the southeast of this country? What city? What city? Charlotte. Charlotte? Savannah. That's Jackson. We don't know. Atlanta. Why? Draw the radius, dude. Dudes. How does stuff get to Atlanta? What comes in trains and what comes in planes and what comes in automobiles? What's the difference between sea cargo? Price of goods. So what travels what travels what travels on rail? Stuff that can take heavy stuff. Heavy stuff of low value. What travels on ships? Small stuff. Heavy stuff of low value with non-perishability. What follow? What 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 goes on airplanes? Time sensitive. Time sensitive, high value, low weight, perishable goods. Okay. So, if stuff is going to be distributed in the southeast, none of the answers you were giving me would make sense. Where's the ship going to call? Jacksonville, Savannah, or Charleston. Why? A short truck home. You, you just saved 600 miles just to Jacksonville. So, what do ships call on to do here? To distribute here? No. To distribute where? America. The Caribbean Basin, right? So, got like Mexico here somewhere, Latin America. Again, I, you know, forgive the uh, South America, Central America, Miami, right? So stuff comes in here to do what? And a bunch of little islands to drop Cuba really big. So. Okay, Puerto Rico really small. No. Do we make Jamaica big? Okay, Jamaica big. It's actually Jamaica. above the Cuba. It's not above Cuba. It is. Yes, it. No, it's not. I think I'm back. I think I'm back.
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's back. Okay. Let's just take it. <laughs> yeah, I take it back. Okay, oh, okay, sir. Let's forget. Okay. Here. Hispaniola is here between Puerto Rico and Cuba. Okay? So, guys, it's to distribute to all of these small economies Honduras, Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, and then El Salvador, which doesn't have an Atlantic coast, right? And then. Colombia, Venezuela, the three Guianas here, and then all of these, Hispaniola, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, uh, and all the little, you know, Windward and Leeward Islands, right? And then a little bit to Brazil. And that's about it. I mean, you got to look at the facts, right? Do we have some commerce with Argentina? A little bit. Do we have some sea cargo business with Chile? Yeah, a little bit, but not a lot, right? This is our market. And these economies are generally what? Smaller economies. So if, if, if you're in Honduras and there's 3 million people in Honduras, can you buy three container loads of clutches? Do you have that many cars? No. You know? No, so you need a central point where you can distribute that. So if you're the guy that's a distributor of auto parts in Honduras, you come to Miami once a month, and I buy clutches from you, and spark plugs from you, and brake pads from you, and tires from you, and you know whatever other windshield wiper things from you, and whatever. And then I go to my 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 freight forward or my consolidator, and and I buy space, or I buy a 20 foot con container from him, and I put all this junk in one container, and I get one container with a bunch of stuff that came in a whole bunch of big containers. That's what the flow of goods is into this marketplace here. And that's what the airport wet market is all about. It happens with heavier, lower add value add product that goes by ship, and higher value, lower weight, lower volume add items that travel by air. Okay? So the question then becomes, all right, yeah, so who am I going to market to? Who am I going to market to? Who are the logical who are the logical potential customers or tenants that you're going to have that are involved in that business? I mean, a bunch come to mind right away. Oil? Oil business? No. What's an oil business? Give me an oil business. Like uh, Shell. Uh, but, 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 shell to do what? Well, we don't, no, no, dude, no, we, we, we don't do transshipment of oil. That's out here in the Bahamas. That's out here in, that's what Aruba and Curaçao and those places were, transshipment of oil. No, 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 not, not oil, not oil, not break, oil. A brake pad company? Brake pad company? Well, so we potentially, we potentially could find distributors to the extent that there are. Now, you live in Dade County. Give me a name of a large distributor that's there. Give me a name of a large brake manufacturer that has it. Probably can't think of any, can you? Because most of them aren't there. Because where's most of the stuff? Where's most of the stuff sitting? For this kind of development, what these guys need to do is get the 3PL guys. Order 3PL guys. The boys? Pepper, Danny Mullen, you make me laugh. <laughs> right. Okay, so third party logistics firms. Oh. Where are the large third party logistics firms? Ryder, UPS, DHL. Those are the guys that rent the 200,000 square foot boxes. Mm. Yeah. Excel. I forget the names of all these guys. but. That's what, the, that's what this facility is built for. You know, you want to put a 200,000 square foot box with 28 foot ceilings and they're kind of giving you the specs of what they want. What are the specs that they want to do? You ask those questions. Mm -hmm. What are the general specs of this product? 30 foot ceilings, rear loaded. Okay, what, why 30 foot ceilings? Uh, that, that was Depends on the racking program that whatever the tenant is. That, that's okay, the so have you ever driven a forklift or no? God forbid, right? I have. I've done that for a living, okay? So, what happens, what's the cost-benefit of going up 30 feet? Okay, so 
okay? The square foot. Your, your window of dry, uh, 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 a dry, um, how do you not say that? How the fuck do you say that? I'm sorry, how do you say that in English? Like where I have my boat in, in storage, you know, the uh, dry dock. Yeah. You ever been to a dry dock facility? You ever been out on a boat where the guy's got a boat on a rack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have. You ever seen the size of the little forklifts? Yeah. They're huge. Mm -hmm. How much do you think those forklifts cost? Yeah, right. Or more. I there's more construction costs than the Well, we're going there. We're going there. But hold on a second. There's a trade-off between the equipment that you need put something up. So what's typical forklift? Look, you guys need to know this stuff if you're going to be doing industrial consulting here. <laughs> what's typical, what's, a, a typical three mass forklift gets product up to how high? 28, 20, 26. You guys are just stabbing in the dark. Typically you can get it up to 20, which makes, which makes it for typically 24 foot high ceilings. Have you taken a look at what the industrial product is in Dade County? Most industrial product in Dade County is 24 feet. Now, a few years ago, at Beacon Lakes, we started building 28 foot high. Why? Because, oh, we're selling people more volume for the same price. Well, you know, first thing is there is an incremental cost to build. There's more concrete. Okay? Uh, and so, you know, oh, well, we're offering them the same, you know, rental rate or whatever, right? But the question is, are people really taking advantage of it? The minute you get past that 20 foot rack, first of all, now the racking system is a lot more expensive. Your equipment is much more expensive. And I'm going to tell you the operator, how easy do you think it is to put something, a 2,000 pound pallet, 30 feet up in the air, as opposed to 16 feet up in the air? What's the velocity of the, you know, the movement, right? And so on paper, it all seems like, oh yeah, well, shit, we could do 36 foot high ceilings, right? We'll get half a million dollar forklifts. But if, if you're running a fleet with 20 forklifts, right, and it's high volume in and out stuff, it's a lot of money. Plus the time involved in, you know, what's the movement up there versus... So the sweet spot in Dade County has been, the evolution has been to 24. So the question goes, do you really need to go Beyond that, I don't have an answer. I don't know where the market's gone in the last six years. But 30 foot is an exaggeration. Have they done any costing at all? Not that they shared with us, but they, 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 it looks like they, um, because they have another, another one there, they have good experience as far as what the cost will be. But did they share with you what they think the, the, the rent is going to be? No. Okay, so. The problem is, what are we talking about before when real estate's about yield, right? So if they're going to build to a higher cost, what do you think the rents are going to be? Because ultimately, I can, I can help you find clients. Can I rent it at $5 a square foot? Can I rent it at $4 a square foot? You know, I mean, they got to work with you a little bit. Um, Third-party logistics firms. Freight forwarders. A lot of times they function like consolidators. Okay? I mean, those are the kind of now, which is not to say, yeah, there's 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 some distributors out there, there are some guys. I um, at the zone we had it was actually we had an operation for a, a clutch manufacturer, <laughs> a Korean one. It was run by Expediters, which is another one of the third-party logistics firms. Okay, they actually you know, outsourced the whole operation. But, yeah, there's some of these guys out there. Have you taken a look at CoStar and looked at the, the big deals? Who are, who are, which were the last big deals done in Dade County? Big Amazon. Big Amazon is, is well, that's one, but that's a build the suit for lease. So, yeah, if they can get that tenant, great. But... Amazon built a suit. I thought it wasn't. It isn't? No, it wasn't. You know that for a fact? I talked to someone. They said it was vacant for like a year. Which space are they taking? No, it was vacant for a year. But what space? What, what, what is it? The Amazon space. What is it? Where is it? Which building is it? It's right next door to this product. It's right, it's right it's here. I don't, I don't know how big it is, but it's right next door. But wasn't it like 400,000 square feet? I think it's more than big, yeah. 
No, I need to know that because I don't know of any 400,000 square foot building that's empty there except for something that we no, sold some I land to somebody. I think it was a computer like you. parts distributor. I don't know. I, I, it may, there may have been a building that was just sort of it was built for somebody and it's been vacant because the typical industrial box is not 400,000 square feet. Can you find out? You can find out at work. Let me know what's happening. I mean, I remember talking when I had a meeting. But find out at work. Guy, he said it wasn't built to suit, it was built spec. Okay, can, was can somebody tell me, months. can somebody tell me, it was right next door, can somebody tell me what that building is and what that deal was? Now, I mean, my only point would be if we're going to say, yeah, like Amazon, well, first of all, how many Amazon sized deals have we had? I don't remember the last deal over, you know, 60, 70,000 square feet in Dade County. But so within this absorption of a million six or a million three over a year, what's the average size of the deal? And which of the tenants, and more important than that, whoever's got access to CoStar, can you tell me all the expirations coming up in the next three years? Because you can get that from CoStar. If you have access to CoStar, now, it may not be 100% accurate, but you can take a look at all the expirations that are coming up, and that's your biggest source of potential business is the one that's already there. So unfortunately, in real estate, the easiest tenant is the one you can steal from somebody else, as opposed to waiting for the Beacon Council to bring a tenant, a new client, a new company into Dade County. Somebody was going to say something. Well, I just had a question. Yeah. How does, how does um, is that, I know they were talking about free trade zone. Yeah, how does that work? So, I mean, like, is that where you ship in parts that aren't assembled, and then you assemble it, and then you ship it out, and you avoid? Taxes. I don't, I don't really so, so um, foreign trade zones in this country are governed by the Foreign Trades Act, Trade Zone Act of 1932. Is it the same thing, free zone, foreign zone? Every country that operates a, a trade zone has its own sort of guidelines and regulations. I'll shortcut through five years of my life involved with one of these. In this country, a foreign trade zone doesn't do a whole lot for you. Okay. Uh, we were able to find a, a modicum of success in the trade zone because we sold two things to our tenants. And it wasn't until we figured that out, we buy the trade zone and we blow out all the tenants practically. We, we were down to like 20% because we wanted to get everybody out and, and rebuild this as a co-location facility. It didn't make any sense to me, but that's what they bought it and they hired me to do this. So we started blowing out all the tenants. And also, we're down to 20% occupancy. This whole tele, you know, telecom business blows up. And we're looking at like a $20 million loss on this building, and we got to sell it for the cash flow it's generating. So my thing was, OK, let's make this a trade zone. So I start digging around. What can we do with this? And we stumbled, not because we're good. We got lucky, OK? We stumbled across a variety of different uses. Theoretically, what can you do in a trade zone? In a trade zone, you can bring product in. You're technically outside the United States for customs purposes. So not for USDA purposes, not for FDA purposes, but for um, um, uh, import duty purposes, OK? So you bring the goods in. They're like, they're, like out, they're physically inside the United States, but they're technically outside the customs boundaries of the states. And then you can re-export that merchandise, okay, uh, without ever incurring a duty. That all sounds great. The last year I was at the zone because we had to keep we, we we managed all the flow of goods in and out. The average value of the duties associated with the products that we housed at the zone was like 3.2%. In this country, why do we have such a large trade deficit? Because we don't have any import barriers. We bring everything in and, and practically have no import duties. So if you were to ask me, does a foreign trade zone bring any benefits from a trade perspective? No. 
there's another problem associated with that. There's a competing program called the Bonded Warehouse Program in which you can essentially create, designate at a specific facility the same type benefits without the cost. Because if you're operating inside the trade zone, the operator, the real estate property owner, has to post a bond with the U.S. government to guarantee the loss of potential duties if something disappears from there. And I know, because we had a truck, the tobacco was stolen. Okay, so, you know, but the bonded warehouse doesn't have to have all the security. And the only difference between a bonded warehouse, or many, many, the only difference between a bonded warehouse and a foreign trade zone, other than having much lower operating costs, is you can't manipulate goods inside a bonded warehouse. You can manipulate goods inside a foreign trade zone. So you can assemble, you can break down, you can repackage. Okay? What do we make a living off at the trade zone? Tobacco distributors. Why? Import duties? No. What, is to, what do tobacco products have? Huge excise taxes. You buy a carton of tobacco, it costs you four bucks. That carton costs 50 cents. Everything else are a bunch of taxes. Right? So if you're an importer of tobacco, and at this point, there's a lot of tobacco. It's, you know, all these white labels and you know, Bronco and all these things that are brought in from places like Peru and Colombia and, and Singapore. Most of these guys can't afford to front the excise tax until they sell the, the goods. So at one point we had almost 200,000 square feet of tobacco in the zone that was there, not because it was avoiding any import duty, it was all for domestic consumption, but people were postponing the payment of the excise tax so they could bring it in store it, they made a sale, boom, now they go to the U.S. Treasury, pay the excise tax, and take the stuff out, because you can't finance that with a working capital line. So, it was for postponement of taxes, not the deferral of taxes, okay? We had high security goods, Bulgari, L'Oreal, uh, Cartier, all those guys were there, not because of the duties, well, because we had armed guards around the clock and we were protecting our goods. What else did we have in there? We had people that manipulated goods and wanted to do so under a high security environment. Perfumania. What does Perfumania do? No, it's not knockoff. Test, they test on uh, animals. No. 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 What does Perfumania do? Perfumania buys gray market goods from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, brings them in for resale in this country. So it's all a big game that distributors have, okay? Tobacco guys do this. A lot of the tobacco that comes back into this country is, you know, R.J. Reynolds or, 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 um, The Marlboro people, what are they called now? Altria. Altria. They'll, they'll manufacture all this tobacco and, uh, and it's deemed for foreign consumption and they'll sell it at a different price. It's called dumping. But we don't dump, but we dump. Okay, so okay, so this can only be consumed in Uruguay or something. Well people in Uruguay can't pay four bucks for a carton of cigarettes, so they sell it for much less. Right? But the caveat is it can't be re-imported. But a lot of this tobacco that comes back into the country is tobacco that was sold for export purposes that's coming back in. In the case of Perfumania, which, which is what happens with a lot of these luxury goods, is so, it's a game. So, you know, L'Oreal says, okay, we're selling Costa Rica. We know you can't pay $8 for this bottle, bottle of perfume, but we're gonna sell it for two to you. Okay, I mean, the businesses all work with very high margins. So they sell it at a very low price. But you can't, you can't re-export it. Well, what prevents people from re-exporting it? Well, you, well, if people were honest, they wouldn't do it, right? But people aren't honest because everybody's always trying to find a way to do this. So how do, how do all these brands try to stop this? The luxury goods, they label they barcode, they, they security strip all of the packaging. So what Perfumania did inside the foreign trade zone in Miami was they bought all this great market shit all over the world, 
brought it in, and it had a bunch of women in an assembly line there that would rip the plastic packaging in a nice way, and it would go down a conveyor belt. They would take the material out of the box. They would cut the box with a, a razor blade, strip the security uh, pa uh, labeling from it, re-glue it, put the stuff back in, put it back in the conveyor belt, another lady would grab the plastic and he'd put it in and he'd run it through another shrink, shrink wrap tunnel so it looked like it was newly packaged again and it would go out to the stores. And, and why they did that, it, it's not illegal, but they just did that so they couldn't track who had sold them the gray market goods so they could keep the stuff coming. So anyway, it was just a whole bunch of bastard uses, okay? I mean, I'd like that. I could, there was, here's another one. Here was a guy. I don't know what I'm telling you, so there was a guy. So in Brazil, you can't, you can't import anything into Brazil. It's prohibited. Brazil bitches, uh, the U.S. puts, um, you know, unreasonable, you know, uh, um, quotas on our orange juice, blah, blah, blah. You can't bring anything into Brazil. You have to manufacture it in Brazil. So we had a guy that had a Kawasaki distributorship in Brazil. But he didn't want to manufacture in Brazil. So he would buy motorcycles from Japan, Kawas, bring them into the zone. And it was a chop shop. They'd strip the bikes, put it all in the boxes. That would ship to the foreign trade zone in Manaus. And there he had another chop shop where he would put the motorcycles back together. Now they were assembled in Brazil. And he would sell it in Brazil at his dealerships at a lower cost than what the local manufacturer could produce. And they were official bikes. So, but we found a bunch of bastard uses. And ultimately, you know, we got up to about 70% occupancy. I don't think they've ever done much more than that, okay? Um, so you were buying leasing to a tenant that would strip out security strips and repackage? Would I do it? No, no, but you were okay as a landlord leasing? Yeah, I mean, I inherited that. Dude, I mean, the only problem I had with that guy is I had to go there every month and get the check. Because he was always late. It's not illegal. Yeah, but... It's not illegal. What's the stability of that tenant? Perfumania was a publicly traded company. Are they still alive? Yeah, in a different form. I mean, they kind of lost a little bit of their luster, and I don't think they're publicly traded anymore. I mean, it, was, it wasn't illegal. It's not illegal. Now, listen, would I rather not be in that business? Yeah, I'd rather not be in that business. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm teaching, man. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know. That I want at least tobacco guys, I mean, they were shady, you know? They were shady guys. They were shady guys. The reason I know about all this import, the, the container that was stolen, number one, it was an inside job inside the guy's shop. And two, what, the reason it became an issue was because it was, it, there were Marlboro that had been destined for Uruguay. When you traced it all, they'd gone to Uruguay, never left the port there, and got on a ship and came back to Miami. So, you may not like it. Hey, most of the electronics that are sold in downtown Miami or in all these places, these Tiger Duracs and all these, you know, these off-brand, where, where do you think all that, that stuff's all great market stuff? You know, the real question is, why do the manufacturers dump product? You can go through that. Why do they dump product in other countries? I mean, they're not foolish. They know it comes back here. No. Yeah. Would I rather just rent a rider? Yeah. You know, but anyway, look, we've invested a fair bit of time, and I need to move on to other material. But what I think is important is, is that you understand the flow of goods in and out of Miami, that you understand who the large tenants in Miami are, that you understand the large deals that have been done recently so that you get an idea of the potential tenant base that's coming up. More importantly, that you get a list of what are the ex upcoming expirations, okay? that you run down to the Beacon Council and see if they're willing to share with you who they're talking to, which they probably won't, 
plus the Beacon Council just sort of takes credit for what other people do, okay? Uh, that you go out there and talk to the big brokers, the big industrial brokers in town. Go talk to Walter Bird. Go talk to Ben Eisenberg. Go talk to Juan, eh, eh, Jose Juncadella at Fairchild. Eh, go talk to Wayne Ramowski at Cushman. Go talk to the big industrial brokers and say, hey, what big deals are coming up? Who's coming into town? Because ultimately, that's, that's who's going to fill this space up. And the real question is, is if their business has been, so you've got to know who you are. If their business has been small bay, small user, front-loaded, 16-foot high clear buildings with a 40% or 50% office build-out, what makes them think that they can all of a sudden compete with Prologis next door, doing this beautiful Class A, 200,000 square foot box, and without having necessarily the broker base to bring that. Because at the end of the day, the brokers will steer business to where they want. They won't keep it. At the end of the day, you can hide three things only for so long. Siddhartha Buddha. Buddha. One is the sun, two, the moon, and the third, the truth. So the truth will eventually prevail, okay? But brokers can steer the truth for a long time. And I can tell you at the zone, we didn't used to get a lot of looks at big tenants because there was a bias in the brokerage community because the previous owners never worked with brokers. They did all the leasing in-house, and so all the brokers in town are like, we don't like those people. And it took a long time to get look, and there was a, pre a prejudice as to what our building offered, you know, what our costs were, and so a, a lot of times, that was the fight I had with our brokers is, because our brokers rep multiple assets in town. So I'd go to, I'd go to Hunka and say, well, why did you take Ryder to Beacon Lakes and to Flagler Station and you didn't bring them by here? To which I never got an answer. <laughs> to which is why he never gave us that SOIR thing three years ago when I spoke. <laughs> so for the purposes of our project and our presentation that we're going to be doing, should we challenge them on, because they're very dead set on, this is a site plan, this is what we want, this is what you have to work with. And for the purposes of, the, of, of what we're doing, should we challenge them on on what they're already set on or just work with what they got? Well, I think, you, I think you'd have to be very delicate with that if you do. I mean, unfortunately, at the end of the day, I think with what you've been charged, your goal is to try to steer them to what potential client they're going to. You may want to say, hey, there are only so many of these deals coming up. As an alternative, have you considered, boom, I think you got to be very careful with that. I got because it seems to me like this is what they want to do. They don't know anything about it. They're going to play like they don't know anything about it to see what you guys can come up with, okay? Uh, but you're you're probably going to have to address their question, you know. And their question is probably going to be, what tenants can I get here, right? Uh, but I, I think you kind of got to. I think if you again, I don't know what the purpose of or, or what the focus or the basis of the presentation is going to be, but if you kind of start with a little bit more macro, here's what moves through Dade County, here's the square footage that's in this market, this square footage is occupied by these users. These are the large tenants in the market, these are the large expirations coming up, these are the large deals that have been done, you're looking to fill 400,000 square feet, you're obviously going to, you're not going to want to subdivide that if you can avoid it. So. Each building's what, like 200,000 square feet? Yeah. You ideally don't want to subdivide it, and if you do, you don't want to subdivide it more than once, maybe twice, which is a problem. Because I need 130,000 square feet. Great. I got it for you. I got a 150,000 square foot building here. I'll put a demising wall here. No problem. I want a 20,000 square foot expansion. Right. What are you going to tell the guy? No? Well, now, what do you do with the 20,000 square feet? Where are you going to lease it to? 
when somebody else has a right of a first refusal on it or an expansion right. And that's going to happen with these big box, because these big box guys are always pitching business. And they don't want to be in multiple buildings. So, you know, that's a reality there. You step up to this, you're playing with different players now. So, anyway, this is helpful. Absolutely. Any more monkey wrenches left? Or? A whole lot more, but I don't have time for that. You guys, you got to worry about something else. Listen. So, uh, some time ago, I agree. Some time ago, some of you took an accounting class with me, and I used to do a, I used to do a case study in the accounting class. That was a, a, a commercial closing. So say, what's a closing? So what's a closing? What's a closing? Melissa, what's a closing? Sorry. Okay, well, it's when a deal goes through. Okay, that's part of it. What else is a closing? How do you how do you document a closing? A deed. A deed? Exchange of title. What else? Who's done a closing lately? Who's bought a house lately? Let's look at residential transactions for a second. Sorry? Well, people exchange compensation. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. How do you document? How do you document a right. closing? Typically, a general warranty deed between the seller and the buyer. Important public record. Uh, I take underwriting for two hundred. And the answer is. If, who's bought a house lately? Has anybody ever seen one of these things? A what? A HUD what? HUD one. A HUD one statement. What's a HUD one statement? It's, a, it's, a, it's not a HUD one statement. It is a settlement statement, right, which is HUD form number one. Okay, what's HUD? One of the departments um, 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 of the executive branch. And, but, but so I just put this up for a second. When you have a closing, when you exchange compensation and convey or transfer deed to a property, the deed to a property, it's all documented in a settlement statement. And wh what a settlement statement is is what a settlement statement is the history. It's the summary of all of the cash flows that have been involved in that commercial closing or that, that residential closing. So it's, it's, it's the history book to a real estate transaction. And by federal law, by federal law, one needs to have a settlement statement when a real estate transaction is closed. And that real estate statement must, must, by law, document and disclose all cash flows in and out related to a transaction. Is that clear? Does that make sense? You now, said it's the history book? Yeah, I say it's a history book. It's a statement. It's a statement that discloses all of the cash flows in and out. In part, why is it done? Well, it's convenience. It's a one place where you can review something, where you can get information from. From a federal perspective, why would the government care? You want to make sure that all transactions are properly recorded, right? So that there's a history that you can go back and audit. Why would a broker want a settlement statement? So he can get his commission, right? So you can see everything. What's, what should he be paid on, right? So that there's total transparency in a transaction, okay? So I just popped this up. I'm not going to go over this. I'm just going to tell you, you may have seen this. This is a very common This is a very common form that's used. In fact, it's required for residential transactions. A HUD-1 is required for residential transactions. And it ultimately guarantees in the residential term sense that 
all of the purchase prices and all of the deposits and you know been disclosed the commissions are paid uh, that property taxes have been properly prorated etc what are we doing commercial transactions what happens in the commercial world so I'm going to take this out because I don't really care about this what happens in the commercial realm? Alex, you've been involved in any closings lately? A few months ago. It's a very similar sheet that's presented. Who prepares it? We, we prepared our own and had it reviewed by our legal counsel. And you were functioning as what? Typically, what I've seen done is that we were the were you the escrow agent on this thing? No. So did the title company? Yeah, First American Title. So First American it's did their it. sheet, but we still. Okay. Okay. So, so the I guess purpose. We do all the prorations is a yeah, lot of. Work. So, so, so the purpose of of this discussion is, if we're going to do due diligence, it's ultimately because we're going to buy something, right? And at the time we buy it, somebody's going to submit or present a settlement statement to us. And that settlement statement is going to require us to review a series of calculations to make sure that income and expense items are properly disclosed and adjusted and reflected, right? That all items that need to be paid in and out of closing are properly reflected. That all deposits that have been made have been properly accounted for, right? And that ultimately, you ultimately build up to a line that says, cash due to or from a buyer or a seller in order to execute this transaction, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I go back to my question. Is there a form that is used in commercial real estate transactions? So we have in residential, we have a HUD-1. Is there an equivalent for commercial transactions? It could be yes or no. Yeah. How many say yes? How many say no? What does everybody else say? I don't know. The answer is there is not. There is not. And commercial practices vary from city to city, from county to county, and from state to state. And so it's very important that you always keep your eyes open as it relates to a closing. Because not every two escrow agents are going to present a settlement statement in the same way. Not all closing practices are common. So, is it common for a buyer to pay dock stamps on recording a deed or a seller? Depends, right? More importantly, in commercial transactions, things are generally not done by practice. They're done by contract. And so anything related to a closing should be addressed in a contract. When Jesse was talking about a purchase sale agreement that's this big, hopefully you're addressing in there who's paying for title insurance, who's paying for recording of a mortgage, right. who's paying for recording of a deed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in a commercial closing, everything is generally negotiated. Everything is negotiated. And ultimately, how you settle with the buyer or the seller has to do with what you agreed to at the time that you entered into the purchase sale agreement. I'm going to pop up a form. Alex mentioned there are two large title companies in this country. Which are the two largest one? Alex mentioned First American. Which is the other large? It's a bunch of title companies. There's two large, large, the two largest. One is First American. The other one is Fidelity. Chicago Title. Those two companies tend to do the lion's share of title policies. There's a whole bunch of other ones. They tend to do in commercial transactions. They tend to do the lion's share. And because of historical precedent, title companies tend to offer as part of their services the escrowing or the closing of a transaction. And so they are ultimately going to prepare the settlement statements and send them to you for you to review. Okay? These are fluid processes. This doesn't happen, here's a statement, you approve it. Stuff's happening every day, every day. Sometimes you might look at three drafts of this. And 
If you're going to close today, but you close tomorrow, and you're prorating rents, you got to change that. You got to prorate property taxes, you got to change that. If you're prorating expenses, which is not as common, you got to prorate that. So every day is going to change the settlement statement, all other factors being equal, just the passage of time. If you're assuming a mortgage, the interest that's accrued or going to be you know, paid by one party or the other is going to be um, 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 reflected. So, First American has a nice form, and I'll send and I'll send this to you. Well, here, let me show you. I can just show you this. This was a an industrial asset that um, we purchased in Jacksonville, and I can just use use this as form. This is so a a commercial closing statement could be a buyers only. So you may have a transaction where the buyer gets a settlement statement and the seller gets a settlement statement. Or you can get a combined, in which everything is reflected on, on, on one page. Why might, why might you have different settlement statements for buyers and sellers? Maybe one party doesn't want the other party to know some of the expenses that they are incurring in a transaction. And what's common with that is commissions. They don't, you know, you, you may not want the seller to see who you paid a commission to, or the seller may not want to see where some of their proceeds are going. Okay. Um, settlement statements aren't debits on the left, credits on the right. In in the realm of settlement statements, we talk about buyer's credits and buyer's charges. And we talk about seller's credits and seller's charges. And are very intuitive. A buyer's credit would be what, for example? A seller's charge. Seller what? Buyer's credit is a charge coming from the seller. Say what? It's a charge going to the seller. Okay. Before we go there, because not all credits to a buyer are necessarily, you know, impacting a seller. Okay. Give me an example of a potential credit to a buyer. If you're a buyer of a building, fixing a roof. Would you fix a, a roof before you closed on it? No, if yeah, a credit to a buyer, you say. Right. Yeah. So oh, let's let's start early on. A loan, I, um, a loan amount coming in to help that person buy it. Okay, let's be more basic than that. I put a deposit on something. It's a credit to the purchase price. Why? Because I prepaid it. Okay. What is the most basic of charges to a buyer? Don't look up there. The purchase price. I'm charging you forty million dollars for this asset. Okay. It's, right, right, right. Okay. it's not debits and credit, it's intuitive. Buyers charge. What is being charged to the buyer? What is being credited to the buyer? Now, as extensions of what you were saying, it could be that during due diligence, you identified that there was a defect in a roof, and a seller says, okay, I'll give you a credit for that against the purchase price. So they may say, the purchase price is, you know, 70 million, and we're going to give you a credit of two million to replace the roof. Just like they could lower the price to 70, okay? But notice the two most basic of things, right? Consi consideration, right? What's the purchase price, the charge to the buyer, deposits and escrow. Several deposits have been made, right? Okay? So from that flow, all the transactions that impact a closing. You may assume some deposits that are, you know, tenant deposits. You may assume a loan. You may get a new loan. A seller may have to pay off a loan. You may have to pay a bunch of charges along the way. Surveyors, title insurance, attorneys. People like to get paid at the time of closing. Why? So once the money's gone, how do you get paid? Brokers get paid at closing. Why? So once the money's gone, they ain't getting paid. 
Attorneys get paid at closing. Why? So once the money's gone, they don't get paid. All the other professionals involved, surveyors, uh, appraisers, people that make photocopies, they get paid at closing. Why? Because once the money's gone, they ain't getting paid. They ain't getting paid. You got it. You got it now, right? So everybody gets paid, okay? So, the concepts. Purchase prices, in that case, a charge to a buyer is in fact a credit to a seller, mm -hmm. right? But as you can see, deposits, which are credits to a buyer, are not necessarily a charge to the seller unless the deposit is being held by the seller. But the seller never holds, you'd never give money to a seller, would you? You'd always put it in escrow, right? Yep. So, so it doesn't impact the seller, okay? But ultimately, the end result of this transaction or this whole process is, well, let me jump. So let's go through. Can you blow that up? Just yeah, so I'll blow this up a little bit because it's important, okay? So sort of general concepts that you're going to have are purchase price, payments made against the purchase price, okay? Any adjustments that are made, okay? Any adjustments that are made related to the transaction. It could be we could be prorating rents. It could be that I'm closing on the second and I've agreed to give you the month's rents, but I'm responsible for collecting them. Anything is fair game. What is common is to prorate expenses, property taxes in particular. Most other expenses tend not to be prorated. What tends to happen is the day you close, the previous seller terminates his agreements and you enter into new agreements with, with service providers. Utilities, what do you do? You get the power company and the phone company and the gas company to come in and re-meter the day you buy. That way, they bill right up until the guy left and you go forward with the new buyer the day that he came in. And then you're, you're going to see a series of, you know, attorneys, right, commissions, to the extent that there's debt being assumed. If it's assumed, it's credited to the, to the buyer, I'm sorry, to the seller, and charged to the buyer. Sorry. Charged to the seller, credited to the buyer. And ultimately what you work down to is cash due from or to a buyer, cash due from or to a seller at closing. So in this particular case, the seller was due $35 million and the buyer had to come up with $55,000. He'd already made some deposits and he was assuming a loan. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I know I'm just kind of I'm doing this very conceptually, very top level. But you're going to have an opportunity to do this yourselves. And you've done this case study, and I'm going to ask you two things. One, that you don't go back and look at what you did. And two, just since you're a CPA and you're the CFO of a company, I'm going to grade you at a much higher level than everybody else, even if you look back. So here's, what, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send you some instructions. What were the zoning thing? Was that just a review to make sure the tenants were? There wasn't any Hold on. Let me see. liens on the tenants? I don't remember this one. I just yeah, pulled it up from one of my notes. Um, this is towards the bottom? Yeah, it's zoning <coughs> compliance. They're like 450 bucks for each one. Zoning compliance reports. Yeah, so there were a bunch of re there were seven buildings here. And so somebody was engaged to go out there and do that, and it was 450 bucks a piece. But again, so look, that's part of diligence. A buyer could just pay that out of pocket, or everybody rushes to just send all this to closing and get it taken care of at one time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is send you a real-life case study. I've changed some of the names, and I've eliminated some of 
the complexities of this particular transaction. Okay? Um, but I'm going to send you a bunch of facts. And they're not all in order. So you're going to be charged or tasked with making a, a commercial settlement statement for this transaction given all these facts. Yeah, pretty simple. Don't wait till the last day to do it. Um, I'll send you very clear instructions, very clear and precise instructions, and I will grade this very rigorously. And it is, and it is an individual assignment. And it is an individual assignment. It is not a group assignment. Okay. No need for questions now. You'll have plenty of time. I'll get this out probably tomorrow, Monday at the latest. You'll have till the following Tuesday to get it done. Okay? But you'll be prepared to, after the completion of a diligence process, actually closing. Okay? Yeah. All right. All right. Now, now with that said, I um, some other things here. Let me see. Now, if you'd like, I mean, you guys, you guys have gone over title insurance in, in your investments class? No? No. I don't no. That. no. You, you haven't gone over, or in your law class? No? Title insurance? We've talked about it in the law I class. I still don't get it. No, it's just, I think we know what it is. He just briefly talked about it. Yeah, I mean, briefly. So title insurance is exactly what it says. It's insurance that one acquires to protect, to insure you from certain defects of title. In particular, it addresses defects in title. And one of the most common defects that, that title insurance addresses are fraud. We talked about earlier, right? Um, who, who issues it? OK, so there are companies that specialize in issuing title insurance. And again, commercially speaking, there are two large ones. Pragmatically, more broadly speaking, I don't know the number, but there's a limited number of title companies that exist out there. Um, generally, the risk is low at this point because, as Jesse alluded to earlier, practically every property in this country now, you know, the records going back to the 1600s are, are in digital format. There's an abstract on. So, I mean, you can start looking at an asset and call a title company and they can give you that ab abstract and they can already, without even insuring it, every commercial piece in this land already has an abstract done. Okay, So it's a relatively low risk business for the insurance company because everything is known, right? So the real risk is fraud, fraud in the inducement, uh, lack of competency, right? Yes, I'm one of the rightful owners, but I didn't have the right to convey it because I, because it's me and my wife, and she has you know 50% interest, and she didn't agree to it. And you may represent that you know you're signing on both parts. Uh, unrecorded liens. I mean that kind of stuff just doesn't happen that much anymore, but it could. So those are the common. So unrecorded liens, like what? Like there was a mortgage that never got recorded. Like there's some sort of mechanic or contractor's lien that was filed, but it just you know, never reached the public record, right? Um, boundary or survey errors, um, easements that haven't been recorded or haven't been properly disclosed, right? So, you know, for example, using Jesse's case earlier in which there was a deed restriction, there was no, you know, in the chain of title, there was a disclosure that 60 years ago something had been filed. If that had not, if that had not been disclosed, then the title policy would have to pay. Right? In the example of the guy that represented to own something that he didn't, had he conveyed it, right, the title insurance would have covered. His friend, right, that bought some land, had he gotten a deed and gotten title insurance, First of all, the title company would have said, hey, well, actually, the other guy didn't have, didn't have a deed either, right? But there was fraud there. So if he bought title insurance, the seller had committed fraud because he didn't have title to this. 
there wasn't a proper documentation, but there was a legal contract prior to this that had conveyed title to somebody else. Somebody had paid, right, in exchange for something. So remember, contracts should be written, but don't have to be. So, but again, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insurance that is offered or provided by a specialty carrier. There are a limited number of them in this country, and they tend, they insure against defects in title, in a transfer of title to somebody, and they tend to cover fraud, lack of competency, errors in surveys, boundaries, um, unrecorded liens, unrecorded covenants, or deed restrictions. But so like with a deed restriction, what are they paying out? If there was a deed restriction that was not recorded, and there's values, because that's the other thing is, is there has to be some sort of degradation and value, right? You have to, so in the case that was mentioned right. of the alcohol, right? You buy something, assuming that that, that that deed restriction or covenant hadn't been disclosed, now there's a decrease in value to your asset, right? So what would they have covered? Probably the cost of curing that, the cost of the land, and the cost of the zoning process and the bridge that had to be built. Why would there be an unrecorded deed or an unrecorded Well, there could be, I mean, there could be errors, right? You know, you could run down to the courthouse. It's unfathomable, right? It's unfathomable in today's environment, but somebody stamped it, didn't, you know, didn't digitize it or something. What other reasons aside from, like... Maybe there's fraud. You go to a small town, right, and, you know, uh, you know, somebody's in cahoots with, you know, you get a release of lien, you know, or, or or somebody decides to hold back a lien for someone to a particular period of time. I don't know. I mean, I again, fraud typically has something to do with most of the issues surrounding title. So I've never heard of somebody collecting on a title policy. I'm sure that it happens every now and then, but I've never heard of that. Premiums tend to be very high. In the state of Florida, premiums are also mandated. They're state mandated, just like Jesse mentioned in Texas. The difference is that title insurance companies pay very high premiums. Who typically writes the title policy for you, your attorney? Who's getting a, a huge commission on the title policy? The attorney. And so what you need to do is negotiate that. So you can't change the state stipulated rate, but what you can do is you know, by default, get a credit. But what, what we used to do is we used to give our, our attorneys the closings without paying them. And we'd say, we don't want to know what your commission is, just don't charge us for your work. So, you know, they do, you know, they, they, you know, they'd issue the opinion on the title, you know, they'd look at all of our zoning, you know, uh, and they would charge us for their services. And we'd let them make the commission. That's what we did. Right, wrong, or different. Why, why is it that, why is it when you get the title policy that, so they're doing the title, but then also you have to do it for the, the mortgage? Well, so there's two, there's two different components of title insurance, right? You as a buyer, you as a buyer want to be protected against defects in the title. A creditor is going to want the same security in the event that there's a why because if if his if his debtor now has a problem with his title he's not going to get paid so there are title policies for the buyer and there are title policies for the lender in the event that there is financing involved in a transaction but isn't it still just to the t title i mean it seems to it's be related like to title problem. but they're two different beneficiaries it's two different policies but if there's a problem, it's still the guy still has to has an obligation to the for his mortgage. Right, and that's why, but that's why the title, that's why the, the, the bank, the bank, the creditor is going to say, I want title insurance because if there's an issue, I don't care about your problem with the deed. I want to get paid off. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's the bank. I sell you something. There's fraud involved. Now you got a problem. Now you're suing me, you're trying to collect on a title policy. This guy says, I don't care about that. Just pay me off and then you do whatever. Take care of it. 
So that's why there's two separate policies. And what tends to happen is a lot of, in a lot of places you just tend to endorse policies that, so I buy a building, I pay for a premium. A lot of times one of the things that you give as a concession as a seller is you'll endorse your title policy to the buyer. So you'll say, okay, I'll deliver title and, and, and title insurance to you at my cost. Because it should be cheaper for me to endorse my policy than for you to go out and get an outright brand new one as a buyer. Because theoretically there's no additional risk now to the title company, right? Th they've already done the work. All they're doing is collecting a premium to pass that risk on to somebody else. And it sounded like a stipulation in their contract that it's not assumable or... No, no, title policy, no, title insurance is not assumable, but it can be endorsed for a fee. So most companies will endorse it, most title companies will endorse it for a fee. And all these ancillary fees that you continue to talk about, I mean, doesn't it make more sense for all these things to be taken in-house, or is it just the cost of having overhead of, of a legal counsel reviewing constant documents and, and doing all these things versus Look, going out and... I thought at, at Flagler we had two full-time attorneys, and we would never do any of this. I mean, dude, just, they dealt with corporate matters. You got HR issues, you got, okay. you know, corporate documentation issues. Uh, now, and they would get involved in helping us negotiate contracts, but you know, imagine, imagine you're, look in our case, we had a hundred buildings. I forget how many tenants we had. Two thousand tenants. I mean, if we were just doing our leases in-house, we'd have a whole legal team. Now, some people decide to staff up, get one attorney that just does that, and get a couple paralegals. The guys that ran Trade Zone before we bought it, it was a mom and pop operation. They had in-house counsel. He negotiated every lease, and he did everything in-house. It's a philosophy, but there was a cost associated with it, and there's also a risk that you got a one-man show. And when business slows down, you still. Well, you have that overhead, plus more important than that, there's no fresh thinking, there's no review. Um, standard coverages are forgery, impersonation, lack of competency, undisclosed but recorded prior mortgages or liens, undisclosed but recorded easements or use restrictions, erroneous or inadequate legal descriptions, lack of a right of access, and deed not properly recorded. I, I kind of mentioned that. You could get extended coverages for other things like deeds to lands that may have buildings or other encroachments on it, incorrect surveys, silent liens such as mechanics or estate tax liens, previous or existing violations, subdivision laws, zoning ordinances, CCRs, um, Can you endorse a residential title policy? I don't think so. I think those are new. I think in, in the residential realm, those are all new. I, I mean, maybe with very high end, you know, multi million dollar houses, you can get a title company to do that. But I, I've not seen that. I mean, I'm not a, any residential people that have seen that here. I've never seen that. But I'm telling you, in commercial, it's. Uh, there's a whole series of, of items that you need to pay at closing, okay? Um, okay? So, buyer, see, you have to assume, okay, so you negotiate everything. Assume that when a contract is silent, local customs and practices are going to prevail. But it's better not to leave things silent, okay? So. You know, in Florida, uh, so assume buyer is typically going to pay for all his closing costs, okay? His title premium, his dot stamps, right? Uh, intangible tax. And then, you know, the seller is going to typically provide title. That's it. Now, can you negotiate everything? Yeah. Can, is it typical in Florida that a buyer will convey title? and pay for a title policy. I've seen that a lot. I mean, that's been my personal business practice or experience. And then you've got a series of, you know, if you have a mortgage, you've got to file the stamp, you know, the, the, the mortgage, you've got to pay dog stamps. There's a transfer tax, 
Okay. That's it. You'll touch most of these things in a case study. I didn't, the title was at least general. Does that make sense? Anything else on? Oh, wait, you had a question. I, I was wondering the mechanics again of if your closing agent also does the uh, title insurance, what, which part do you negotiate? If you're closing, so you're dealing directly with the title company. Right. You're not going through your attorney. Well, if we went through an outside attorney. He's getting a commission. On, on, on the title policy. Right. So and he, it's yeah. a big commission. So it's a huge he, commission. That's why he shouldn't be charging us fees. Or he, he or he needs, or he needs to kick, kick something back to you somehow. However ethically they can do that. Okay. So, I don't think that they have a legal obligation to disclose their commit, commit commissions to you. And I don't know what I mean. My understanding is a commission.